In previous modules, we have only briefly mentioned the term linkage disequilibrium, or LD. In module 10, it will be our focus and will pave the way for the introduction of association genetics and genomic selection. LD is at the root of virtually all marker-informed breeding applications. Most outcrossing plants, including the vast majority of coniferous and flowering trees, have genomes that are largely in linkage equilibrium at the population level. QTL mapping works because specific crosses create short-lived LD as a function of genetic linkage, unspoiled by generations of recombination or crossing over. Strong LD is largely a function of tight linkage, though as we shall see, there are other factors at play. Indeed, alleles in different genes at great distances from one another on a linkage group, or even on different linkage groups, may persist in LD for some time. The study of LD has revealed a great deal about genome organization and evolution. The previous module introduced the concept of QTL mapping in controlled crosses or pedigrees and described its utility for characterizing the genetic basis of quantitatively inherited traits. In this module, we briefly introduce an alternative approach to complex trait dissection called association genetics, but spend most of the module discussing linkage disequilibrium, the genetic basis or foundation upon which association is built. Just to make sure you start, start off thoroughly versed, association genetics has also been called association mapping or linkage disequilibrium mapping. Sadly, the term linkage disequilibrium itself is a bit confusing, but has solidly found its way into the vernacular. Most geneticists would prefer the term gametic phase disequilibrium. In the subsequent module, we provide a more thorough discussion of association mapping itself. It is often said that QTL mapping is based on linkage, while association genetics is based on linkage disequilibrium. The distinction is perhaps not fully warranted and certainly needs explaining. LD measures non-random association among alleles, describing the extent to which the presence of an allele at one locus predicts the presence of a specific allele at a second locus. This sounds a great deal like QTL mapping. We seek to find a marker allele that predicts a QTL allele. How is it that that different from LD? In large part, the distinction is one of degree. With families, which are the product of only one or two generations of recombination, LD extends over rather large chromosomal blocks. This is called high or large LD. Now consider simply sampling an array of unrelated individuals, each the product of tens to hundreds of generations of crossovers. Chromosomal blocks in these individuals are much smaller, and markers even a few centimorgans away from a QTL may not be predictive of the QTL allele desired. Association genetics seeks to find markers that remain in disequilibrium with the QTL, even after all this recombining. To be fair, LD is a bit more complicated. Two loci may be in strong LD even though they are not tightly linked. Again, we call upon this cartoon to illustrate the distinction between the approaches to complex trait dissection. In the figure, the gray rectangle represents a gene situated along a chromosome, and the little symbols are markers or mutations. For family-based QTL mapping, flanking markers within some reasonable proximity of the QTL will suffice for prediction. Association genetics seeks to find markers that are in much greater LD with the QTL, preferably within the gene responsible and near the causal polymorphism or the actual causal polymorphism itself. A causal mutation is denoted as a QTN, or quantitative trait nucleotide.
So it should be apparent from diagrams, such as these, that there are some significantly different requirements for association genetics relative to family-based QTL mapping. One obvious distinction is the number of markers required to locate the associations. Let's take a quick look at the key differences between the two approaches before lunging on with our discussion of LD. This table provides a concise comparison of pedigreed QTL mapping and association genetic mapping. QTL mapping requires but a modest set of framework markers to locate QTL. Depending on what approach is taken for association genetics, hundreds to many thousands of markers may be required. Human association studies based on whole genome scans can use over 200,000 markers. Family-based QTL mapping looks at one family at a time with many progeny per family. Association genetics requires many families with only one or a few individuals per family. Analytical approaches for the two methods may share similarities, for instance the use of ANOVA or regression, but vary greatly in some protocols required to reduce risk of falsely identifying QTL. Association genetics is vastly superior in pinpointing the location of causal polymorphisms, in finding all the genes affecting the trait of interest, and in providing a predictive tool that is functional within and among populations. In short, association genetics is a preferred approach for marker-informed breeding and resource management. So let's begin our LD discussions by reviewing a few simple tenets, some of which you have already seen. LD is a measure of non-random association among alleles at different loci. One would expect population LD to be zero for most two locus comparisons, since most loci segregate totally independently of each other. Of course, without LD, associating markers with QTL would not be feasible. LD can provide information on a population's history. For instance, if LD appears to be high in a population, one can deduce that recent bottleneck or admixture events likely took pace. For those entertaining the use of association genetics for practical purposes, characterizing the patterns of LD in their species and populations can guide the number and distribution of markers required, as we shall review shortly. The last bullet here refers especially to the issue of population subdivision, which can lead to the detection of false positive associations. This too will be discussed later. By now you should have a pretty good conceptual idea of what constitutes LD, but if not, this picture should help. These two cartoons demonstrate the two ends of the range of LD in a population. Notice that on the left, figure A, only two types of haplotypes are observed, with the orange allele at locus 1 completely associated with the blue allele at locus 2, and the aqua allele of locus 1 associated with the yellow allele of locus 2. This population shows maximum LD denoted by d prime equals 1. We'll define d prime in a moment. On the right, figure B, all four gamete classes are equally frequent, such that an orange allele at locus 1 is just as likely to be associated with a blue or yellow allele at the second locus. In this instance, there is no LD at all. Loci are behaving independently of each other. At first blush, LD seems relatively straightforward, but much like quantifying molecular diversity, there are multiple measures of the strength of two locus association. The first measure of LD was proposed in 1960 by Lewinton and Kojima. It was simply termed D. 
The frequency expectation for a multi-locus genotype is simply the product of the single locus allele frequencies. The difference between the observed and expected multi-locus genotype was termed D. The sign of D can be either positive or negative, depending on allelic designation. It is strictly arbitrary and has no biological or genetic relevance. The problem with D, as you might intuit by playing with various combinations of allele frequencies, is that the range of D is a function of allele frequencies. D has no relative interpretive value. To address this weakness, Lewinton in 1964 and later Hill and Robertson in 1968 developed standardized measures of LD. We'll briefly look at each of these measures of LD denoted as D prime and R squared. Both range from 0 to 1, that is from no LD to complete LD, and both are common in the literature. They are sensitive to different things and there is no universal agreement as to which should be used. We'll introduce the measure D prime first because of historical precedence. The basic idea behind D prime is to use it as a relative measure of LD given the maximum theoretical value and given observed allele frequencies. D prime ranges from 0, no LD, to 1, large LD. You might find it useful to think of D and D prime as a difference between counts and percentages. 10 six students in a class of 300 isn't too bad, but it's only 3%. Yet 10 six students in a class of 15, 66%, is an epidemic. The second common measure we'll introduce is R squared. It shares similarities with D prime in that it also ranges from 0 to 1, as we noted, and yet it has different properties in some subtle and yet important ways. One distinction is that D prime will always be 1 if any gamete class, that is haplotype, is missing, whereas R squared will only equal 1 if allele frequencies for both loci are the same. The biological interpretation of this numerical fact takes some time to consider. For those interested in comparing the approaches, we recommend the paper cited here. Before we move on, we have to once again address a challenge that we have touched on before, the issue of linkage phase. It is necessary to know phase, or at least to be able to predict it with some confidence, in order to calculate LD. We can do this a few different ways. For those of us that work with conifers, the simplest way to determine phase is to look at an array of seed megagametophytes. We have explained this unique biology enough by now that we need not pester you once again with it. Needless to say, it makes doing many things very easy. With the development of fast and inexpensive, relatively speaking, sequencing technology, it is certainly possible to determine phase from virtually any complex diploid organism. Finally, one can infer or predict phase based up on existing frequency information as found in population data. Interestingly, the statistical significance of a given measure of LD is not determined by the measure itself, but by relatively standard contingency tests, like chi-squared, or in the case of small sample sizes, Fisher's exact test. These are relatively straightforward, and many programs exist to calculate them. 
A very nice, succinct review of statistical tests is provided in Gibson's Gibson and Muse for the 2004 and later editions. We have discussed LD conceptually and mathematically. Now let us give thought to the biological mechanisms that create, maintain, or break down LD. LD must be viewed in a relative way across time, that is generations, and genetic backgrounds, say families or populations. Recall the figures in this slide and consider the two blue arrows. From a population perspective, the chromosome represented by the lower arrow appears to consist of many small chromosomal blocks, each with an array of genes and strong LD. Now take that same chromosome and imagine it representing one of a pair of chromosomes and a cross as indicated by the upper arrow. Our perception of the chromosome in this world is that all genes are in LD. After one generation and one crossover event, roughly half the chromosome is still in complete LD. At any one time, LD exists at multiple levels, small blocks of which persist much longer than large ones. The distinction here is simply that between LD at the family level and LD at the population level. So what factors promote LD? Certainly, proximity or linkage is the main cause. Population admixture will result in LD even when two genes are far apart or on different chromosomes. Selection can both cause and maintain LD through epistasis, where certain allelic combinations are superior to others. Again, in such cases, the epistatic loci need not be tightly linked or linked at all. Mating systems such as selfing or inbreeding will maintain LD. Consider that highly inbred lines exhibit virtually complete LD across the entire genome. And what leads to the breakdown of LD? Again, this is primarily a function of crossing over events. Let's discuss some of these factors at greater length. Population geneticists like to view all evolutionary phenomena from a base case scenario that assumes certain conditions, one of them being random mating. It helps us explain and predict how things work. Take LD, or its alternative, linkage equilibrium, and the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Both relate to the random associations of alleles at one or more loci. The Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium mathematically describes the association of alleles at a single locus or for that matter, at two or more loci, assuming they are independent of one another. LD actually measures that level of independence by gauging whether alleles at different loci are statistically associated. Assuming no evolutionary forces at play, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is reached in one generation of random mating for loci that are not in LD. For those that are, Many generations of random mating are necessary to approximate equilibrium. These bullets should be self-explanatory. When you are done, let's look at some graphical representations of these words. The decay of linkage disequilibrium, as influenced by the recombination fraction, designated here by the letter R, is described by the equation shown here. For unlinked loci, where R is equal to 0.5, LD decays rapidly within a small number of generations. Though in some cases LD may never go completely to zero, it generally comes very close. For closely linked loci, such as shown for the other three cases here, the decay in LD is extremely slow. What about two loci that are located roughly 25 centimorgans apart? Within 10 generations, D will be around 0.06.
bottlenecks or strong inbreeding will result in a significant loss of heterozygosity and consequently the maintenance of very strong LD. If all the individuals in a population share almost all of the same alleles at every locus, then LD will virtually extend over the entire genome, or at the least, linkage group. Individuals from another population of the same selfing species would likely have similarly high levels of LD, but the specific associations would more than likely be very different. So what might we expect LD to actually be in a forest tree such as loblolly pine or Norway spruce? It has only been in the last few years, say since 2005 or so, that we have had sufficient sequence information to really estimate the rate of LD decay. Our expectation was that LD would be relatively low for most of our outcrossing species that exist in large, nearly randomly mating populations. These expectations were largely met. Though considerable variation exists among loci, LD, as measured here by R squared, deteriorates rapidly over distances of hundreds to a few thousand base pairs. From a practical standpoint, markers need to tag causal polymorphisms would have to be located within a very short distance of one another, say 100 base pairs. In the largely outcrossing eucalyptus hardwood species, eucalyptus grandis and eucalyptus urophila, LD appears to decay even faster than for loblolly pine. Of course, these data are for two loci only, and they may not reflect the situation of the genome as a whole. Why? One reason, as we shall see, is that the rate of recombination varies dramatically across the genome and within linkage groups. In fact, it appears that for many species, there are specific recombination hotspots and large areas where recombination is dramatically hindered. This was shown to be the case in poplar, the first tree to be fully sequenced, where large sections of two chromosomes exhibit virtually no recombination. The extent of LD or the average size of LD blocks varies widely among species. For general, in, in general, LD decays more quickly for outcrossing species. In maize, LD varies widely among populations, being the most extensive in commercial inbreds. Note the extremely large ranges for significant level D LD in most of the selfing species. Interestingly, the LD range in humans is quite large. LD blocks of 60,000 to 250,000 base pairs are common, though differences in LD range exist among populations. For instance, LD block size is much lower in Nigerian populations than in populations from Northern Europe. This latter point suggests relatively recent admixture events during the human diasporas. This cartoon illustrates a common tool for visually assessing LD among markers, often called an LD plot or an LD triangle plot. In this example, we zoom in on a small segment of a chromosome, which is a single gene characterized by SNPs in exons, introns, and other non-coding regions. The magnitude of LD can be assessed qualitatively by the intensity of the red color. Bright red signifies high LD, pink less so, and white no LD. Estimates of pairwise LD are obtained by following diagonals to their intersecting square. In some displays, the value of LD, either R squared or D prime, is shown within the boxes. Notice that two blocks are shown here, block one on the left and block two on the right. LD is high within blocks, but tends to break down between boxes, with some exceptions. How do we explain the continued LD between some of the block 1 and block 2 SNPs when LD seems to have broken down between 
say SNP 5 and SNPs 1 through 4. Double crossovers. In any event, the Haploview tool is widely used and freely available online. As suggested earlier, LD is shaped in large part by recombination, but other factors do play a role. In this figure, taken from Stump and McVean, haplotype blocks are illustrated as a function of recombination and demography. In figure A, haplotype and or linkage disequilibrium LD blocks are expected to depend on the sample populations. Generally, the larger the effective population size, the smaller the blocks will be because more recombination, recombination events will have occurred. It is well known that haplotype and or LD blocks will arise by chance even if the recombination rate is uniform. However, if recombination hotspots, such as shown in profile 1 of figure B, are ubiquitous features of the genome, then some aspects of blocks will be transferable between populations, with details of the block pattern dependent upon demography. If, however, recombination shows only mild levels of variation, such as in Profile 2, then blocks reflect past recombination events, and ver only very old recombination events can result in block boundaries that are shared between populations. So, whether or not blocks offer a convincing description of genetic diversity depends on how the recombination rate varies along a stretch of DNA. In the haploview slide shown previously, we viewed an LD plot at a rather restricted level. This diagram shows the extent of long-distance LD on chromosomes 2q left and 7q right for Chinese and Japanese populations from the Human HapMap project. These diagrams make two important points. One, the distribution of LD is not uniform, which we saw earlier, but on a larger scale. Red triangles show high LD within blocks, also called haploblocks, and low levels of LD among blocks. Two, haploblocks are bounded by regions of higher rates of recombination, as indicated by peaks of recombin recombination rates shown below. Such patterns tell us that recombination and LD are related, and that different portions of the human genome are more blocky than others. Here we offer a slightly different haploview presentation for a relatively large section of Loblolly pine linkage group that contains three known genes. This view varies from the others in that LD is quantified above the I diagonal by R squared and below the diagonal by a p-value of significance. Though not shown, imagine that the base pair numbering shown on the y-axis also stretches across the x-axis. The genes, shown here as C3H, 4CL, and AGPX, are characterized at the bottom of the figure by alternating pink and yellow bars reflecting introns and exons, with black lines denoting SNPs. Strength of LD is illustrated by color. A number of points are worth noting here. First, it appears that very little LD exists between genes. Though the odd colored box is found, it indicating LD across many centimorgans. Where do those oddball blocks come from? It could be an epistatic allelic interaction, or very possibly a very rare allele that gives a false impression of LD merely by chance. The second point to make here is that even within genes, LD can rapidly decline over short distances. Next, we look at patterns of LD in another conifer, Douglas fir. In the study reported here, 384 SNPs from 121 candidate genes for cold tolerance were studied. Figure A suggests 
as we have seen before, that LD breaks down pretty quickly within loci, as indicated by this plot of LD decay across many genes. Figure A is a picture of the average rate of decay. The lower figure, B, paints a different picture, however. This haploid view of LD extends across a rather large stretch, 63.7 centimorgans to be exact, of one linkage group. In this plot, Solid lines delineate comparisons within and among candidate genes, with letters indicating placement of candidate genes within the matrix. Clearly, interlocus LD is much higher here than observed in loblolly pine or Norway spruce. This may reflect a very low rate of recombination, though other factors such as selection, mutation rate variation, population structure, and extreme bottlenecks cannot be ruled out. The take-home message here is simply that patterns of nucleotide diversity in LD are highly variable across the genome, within and among populations, and within and among species. We conclude this module with a reference to gene genealogies as introduced in Module 7. We extend the concept to haplotype genealogies and use it to trace how history shapes LD. Mutational events near to one another share common evolutionary fates, unless broken apart by recombination. The patterns of LD seen today reflect literally thousands of years of history, influenced by the rate of mutation and recombination, the strength and direction of selection, demographic events such as population admixture and bottlenecks, and so forth. As we garner more sequence for more species and more individuals within species, more of the evolutionary history of organisms will be revealed.